I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. President Trump is meeting with Mexican President López Obrador today to mark the start of the new North American trade deal. The talks continue despite a last-minute cancellation on the part of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. He backed out of the trip after the Trump administration threatened new tariffs against the country. The White House is hoping the meeting will bring positive economic news, as much of the U.S. reels from the impact of the pandemic. Another way the Trump administration is hoping to help the economy is by reopening the nation's schools. The possibility was a main focus of today's coronavirus task force briefing. I think we would account for the fact uh, that while we hope, uh, we hope every school in America is able to open uh, this fall, there may be some uh, states and local communities that, that given cases or positivity in that community may adjust to either a certain set of days or certain limitations. And we'll be very respectful of that. Earlier today, President Trump called guidelines by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on reopening classrooms, quote, very tough and impractical. He went on to threaten federal funding for public schools if restrictions aren't lifted. He's facing criticism for those comments by governors and educators who say children's lives could be put at risk. The U.S. reached a grim milestone Wednesday, confirming more than 3 million coronavirus cases. That's in part why several Republican senators are now publicly backing out of the party's national convention this August. The event is slated to take place in Florida, a hot spot for new infections. Now, the state's governor and close ally of the president is declining to say whether he'll lift restrictions mandating arenas operate at 50 percent capacity. For more, let's bring in Caitlin Huey Burns and Eugene Scott. Caitlin is a CBSN political reporter and Eugene is a politics reporter for The Washington Post. Welcome to both of you. It's good to see you. Eugene, let me start with you. The president continues to contradict and challenge the advice of the scientists and doctors working in his administration. How is this affecting their response to the pandemic? Well, it's certainly sending mixed messages to people looking to the White House to understand what is the best way to respond to this crisis. Uh, but the reality is the number of people trusting Trump uh, to handle this uh, situation appropriately is, is likely decreasing. Uh, the reality is he is very mindful of his base, people who are faithful to him and who want to stand by him and, and trust him and the conservative media outlets who primarily uh, cover him and who have been very disrespectful and dismissive of the experts. But the the challenge is, when you're talking about something like schools across the country, you're obviously talking about families outside of your base who will be directly impacted by your agenda and ideas and worldview. Uh, and so there are real consequences that could really cause real harm to him just a few weeks uh, before the upcoming election. And Caitlin, as we mentioned, with a surging number of coronavirus cases, you're reporting on a handful of GOP senators choosing not to attend the Republican National Convention this year. Who do we know will not be there, and what other roadblocks is the event facing? That's right. Five senators have confirmed to CBS that they will not be attending the Republican National Convention, which is now going to happen in Jacksonville. Uh, some of them for a variety of different reasons. You have Chuck Grassley and Lamar Alexander, who are uh, older members who uh, would be concerned about the health risks uh, to themselves. Uh, you have Susan Collins, whose office told me that she doesn't attend conventions when she is up for re-election. Remember, she's facing a very tough re-election bid in the fall. Uh, Lisa Murkowski, who has been uh, often a critic of the president, also said she is not going to attend. And Mitt Romney, another Trump critic, has said that he will not attend as well. Uh, but this is significant, because remember, last month, the Republican National Convention moved at the urgency of the president from Charlotte, North Carolina, when uh, it became clear that the Democratic governor there said that he would not lift uh, social distancing guidelines, and the president did not want to comply with those guidelines. Uh, so he moved 
the convention to, uh, or the festivities uh, of the convention, the original business will still happen in Charlotte, uh, to Jacksonville, Florida, which at the time uh, was welcoming the president and wanted him to come. Fast forward a month, and you have seen cases in Florida surge. And when you look at Jacksonville specifically, there is a uh, mandate to wear masks indoors and in effort to uh, social distance. Uh, the the um, mayor of Jacksonville, longtime Republican Lenny Curry, himself is in self-quarantine right now because he was exposed to someone with coronavirus, although he has tested negative. Uh, he is making people wear masks. Uh, and so there are a lot of questions about whether Florida can accommodate the president. Remember, uh, Governor DeSantis issued an, an executive order uh, mandating that crowds not exceed 50 percent capacity. Uh, so a lot of hurdles uh, exist for the president, and you have a lot of Republicans who are uh, waiting to see how this shapes out. We've talked to other lawmakers and RNC members who are just waiting to see what happens uh, because this is such a fast-moving story. So some of them are not ready to commit to going. So at the same time, Democrats are outpacing Republicans in fundraising and spending in a number of contests, including the races of some of those senators not attending the convention. Caitlin, what might be the political calculus here for those senators who are deciding not to go ahead of the election? Right. Well, I mentioned Susan Collins, who's in Maine, facing a difficult re-election bid, and she has really tried to walk a fine line uh, in terms of uh, distancing herself from the president, although she's supported a lot of his policies and proposals and Supreme Court nominees, uh, but also trying to uh, keep the Trump base in her state uh, intact. Uh, so you will see her try to separate there. And that's why we're keeping an eye on some of these senators who are in tough re-election bids in places like Colorado or Arizona and even in North Carolina. Uh, so that's something certainly to keep an eye on. What's notable, however, too, is that uh, you have Democrats in red states like South Carolina and in Kentucky who are raising record amounts of money. In Kentucky, Amy McGrath, who's now the Democratic nominee to take on Mitch McConnell, raised uh, about $17 million this past quarter. Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, who is angling to take on uh, Lindsey Graham, raised about $14 million in this past quarter. That's hugely significant and should uh, concern Republicans, even if those candidates aren't likely to overcome their uh, opponents, because this is a general election year where most money is geared towards the top of the ticket, and Biden has shown to be a formidable uh, fundraiser himself. Uh, and we're also in the middle of a pandemic where you would think that people might be inclined to hold on to their cash. So this is a significant development for Democrats and is uh, raising some concerns among Republicans about uh, keeping their um, uh, majority in the Senate intact as well. Eugene, I want to ask about some voting blocks. You reported on how suburban voters got behind Mr. Trump's message in 2016, but now are, quote, walking away. Remind us, how critical was that voting block, and what's different this time around? Well, we know in 2016, suburban voters were uh, one of the reasons that the president was incredibly successful in states like uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, states that helped uh, determine the election. But when we look at polls recently, uh, Trump is not faring as well with suburban voters. In fact, uh, Biden is actually winning them. And one of the reasons why is because these voters were largely swing voters who uh, some people called uh, Try trying voters, voters willing to give Trump a try. Um, and they did, and they don't like what they have seen. And they're incredibly frustrated, and they say even exhausted uh, by this presidency. And there are a few uh, incidents in particular that really seem to have pushed them over the line. One of them is the president's handling of race matters, his response and pushback to uh, Black Lives Matter and Confederate uh, symbols and, and monuments, as well as how he has uh, taken stances on issues related to Native Americans and naming of uh, sports teams. Uh, these voters very often uh, were said to have been uncomfortable with the president's uh, stance on racial issues, but uh, for the most part, they were willing to look the other way as long as he didn't say, you know, the, the quiet part out loud. But that is not what the president has done, and we see that daily on his Twitter. And this is going to further alienate um, these voters, his current approaches on schools, uh, 
uh, in response to the pandemic, because often when we think of suburban voters, we think of women, we, th we think of moms. Um, and these are obviously voters who are very concerned about the public health uh, of their families. Uh, Eugene, you also wrote about another important voting bloc for the president, white evangelicals. There have been several Supreme Court decisions in recent weeks that have not necessarily turned out as they may have expected. How could that impact how evangelicals vote in November? Well, there have been several that turned out in ways that uh, white evangelical voters were not hoping, but there also have been a few related to religious freedom and liberty uh, that have gone uh, in the way that uh, white evangelical voters would have expected. Uh, as of right now, uh, we see very minimal uh, drops in support from white evangelicals for Trump. But if the courts do not continue to consistently deliver uh, results for these voters who very often told the public that their reason for backing the president was because of what he could promise and guarantee this block uh, by getting conservative judges on benches, there could be some walking away. And we do know uh, that this election, or at least believe, will be decided by percentage points, particularly in swing states. And so when you look at some of these uh, voters who were perhaps very faithful in their support of Trump in 2016 and even the GOP in 2018, if the president continues to lean into uh, some of the topics that make, you know, suburban voters and independent voters uncomfortable, other blocks he won, he could see himself uh, not having as much of the evangelical support uh, as he has had in the past. Caitlin, in our final minute or so, on the other side of the aisle, what voting blocks are we seeing rally around Joe Biden? Well, Eugene makes a really critical point about those suburban women voters, and we've seen that fuel the uh, presumptive Democratic nominee, Joe Biden. But what we're also seeing, in addition to that, is a consolidation, really, of the Democratic Party base. There was a new New York Times poll uh, out this week that showed supporters of Elizabeth Warren, of Bernie Sanders, have uh, really committed, overwhelming majorities of, of those supporters have committed to supporting Joe Biden. And that is a, an effect, I think, that we see uh, as, as Donald Trump is really a galvanizing force among Democrats in terms of turning them out to vote. And we heard this over and over again in the primary that voters' number one concern was finding a candidate who can defeat Donald Trump and they would coalesce around him. So that has happened earlier in the process compared to 2016. Uh, today, for example, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden uh, unveiled an, a 100-page policy report uh, showing a consolidation of, of policy proposals. They had talked about uh, mm -hmm. earlier forming task forces um, to, to come up with proposals. So that was released today, and that again shows a united front, at least at this point, uh, coming from the Democratic Party base with the overall uh, driving force uh, of defeating Donald Trump. Right. Quite a different place than where we were just a few months ago, thinking back to some of those Democratic debates that got very, very heated at times. All right. Caitlin Huey Burns and Eugene Scott, thank you both. Take care.